we dive into all of that, we have a really, really special guest with us today. So Gabby, do you want to tell us more about Garrett? Yeah, everyone. Uh, so everyone say hello to Garrett. Uh, Garrett's a PhD candidate at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, he's an NSF graduate research fellow, a Sloan Foundation scholar, and an Illinois graduate and Mavis fellow. His research focuses on doing experiments with ultra-cold atoms and molecules. He explores using laser locking, cooling, and trapping techniques, electronics, machine learning, and more to create arrays of ultra-cold molecules that behave as controllable quantum systems. He's spoken about his experiences as a Black physicist, including as a writer for Black and Physics Week 2021. And I'll drop the essay in the chat um, if you guys would like to, to read it. Um, it's an essay about preventing burnout um, as, a, as, an undergraduate, as a graduate student. So I'm going to drop that real quick in the chat. And then, Garrett, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Everyone say hello. Um, and also, if we have folks in Illinois on the call today, you can, can also say hi. I'm, I'm sure that'd be great for Garrett to see. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Gabby. Thanks for, the, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, so hi, everyone. My name is Garrett Williams, and thanks for being here on a Sunday. I was just talking to, to Gabby earlier. You guys are a really committed bunch, and it's good to see. So I was asked to speak to you guys a little bit about my journey to quantum, and when I was, when I was thinking about what to say, I found a kind of a two general goals. The first is to convince you that I am not special. And the second is to convince you that all of you indeed are. And I'll show you guys some pretty pictures too along the way. Um, next slide, please. So, so I'm an atomic physicist. I study atoms. And if you've ever taken chemistry before, you may have heard that, that atoms are considered the basic building blocks of matter. They're made up of protons and neutrons and electrons. And by looking at how many of each the atom has, you can tell different species of atoms apart. Hydrogen has, has one proton and one electron. And, and rubidium-87 has 37 electrons, 37 protons, and 50 neutrons, and so on and so forth for every kind of atom. But, but, but something a little more subtle about atoms is that's, that's maybe not talked about a whole lot is the fact that the atom is kind of nature's perfect little quantum mechanical system, right? And there are a few reasons for that. The first, or I guess, for example, every atom of the same isotopic species, if you will, is identical. You know, there's, there's no intrinsic difference between two hydrogen atoms, for instance. They're naturally abundant. We don't have to build them, luckily. They're already there all around us in the atmosphere. In, in, in my little vacuum cell there, there, and we can manipulate them using, using classical fields like lasers and magnets, which is what I do. Um, for, for example, you, you can fire packets of light from your laser at the atoms to slow their motion and, and lower their temperatures to extremely cold regimes, literally, literally one millionth of a degree Celsius and, and further. You can, you can kind of think of it as, 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 you can kind of think of the atom or the light hitting the atom kind of like a, like a tiny fly hitting the windshield of a huge semi truck. One fly may be really small in comparison to the truck, but it still exerts a tiny force that pushes the truck back ever so slightly. And if you have tons and tons of flies hit the truck, you can start to have a larger effect that can slow the truck down. And that was personally what drew me to the field, this idea that the same laser that could burn me if I touch it can actually make something cold, right? And that was fascinating to me, and it made sense when it was explained to me, which is, which is what made me want to learn more about it. So, so, so now I'm a quantum researcher, and the goal of my research is to use lasers to create various interactions, if you will, between atoms or molecules to explore applications in this field called quantum information science, which is, which is sort of this idea that you can fine tune the properties of quantum objects like atoms and entangle them, in, 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 entangle them with each other in ways that you can't do for classical objects. Right, and, and use them to do very unique types of calculations. And that's what's called quantum computing, which you guys have been learning about. But, but perhaps one of the biggest problems right now that limits quantum computing is this, this idea of decoherence. What I mean by that is the interactions between atoms that you've, you've worked so hard to synthesize, they don't last forever and they're actually quite sensitive. Atoms start to interact more strongly with outside influences and their environment better than they do each other. And once they do that, you can't do your calculation. And, and as it turns out, one of the best ways to keep that from happening is to completely isolate your quantum objects from your environment, including yourself, 
So <laughs> they'll be fine as long as you don't touch them, right? But again, that means you can't do your calculation. So this is a conundrum, right? So this phenomenon is called decoherence. And the way I typically like to think about it simply is, is the analogy of like three children playing jump rope, right? one child in the middle jumping the rope and the other two skipping the rope. And if you've done this before, when you were little, you might remember that you have to swing the rope in sync with your partner um, in order to get the rope all the way around. And if you don't, if one swings your arm a little bit later than the other, maybe you're getting tired or maybe it's cold outside, or you forget your jacket, but over time it becomes a little harder or it takes a little longer to get the rope all the way around. And if you guys are so out of sync, you can actually you know, make the child in the middle trip and fall. That's called decoherence. That's what quantum states do after long periods of time. So, so quantum is a really interesting field right now because people are coming up with all kinds of ways to get around these problems and problems like that. And there are a lot of types of quantum systems and techniques, and there's lots of room for creativity and imagination, which is, you know, which is why we need you guys, <laughs> right? You guys are sort of you have a great head start with this program right now. You can already start thinking about these things a little earlier. So, you know, when I was in high school myself, I, I wasn't really the best student. I wasn't the strongest student. You know, I grew up in the, southern's, the, the, the southern suburbs of Norman, Oklahoma. I went to school in Norman, Oklahoma. And as a student, honestly, I, I, I think I was pretty average or a little below average, if that. You know, I didn't particularly excel at any of my classes except for maybe math. <laughs> and honestly, looking back at my math classes, I think the reason why I did kind of well in my math classes is not necessarily because I truly understood what I was doing or really liked it. It's because I, I was good at following procedures, right? And maybe some of you can relate to this. A lot of, in a lot of my early math classes, even up through most of calculus, actually, when I would work through the problems, I found I didn't really have to understand the concepts super well to get the right answer, right? The teachers taught us the, the procedure. And if we knew the procedure, if, you, if I followed the steps, I could succeed. I mean, I, I was taking college level math all throughout high school. I was taking multivariable calculus and differential equations by my senior year. And still, I didn't really feel like I knew what I was doing. I could get the right answers. I could teach other people how to get the right answers, but it felt very formulaic to me. I, I didn't feel like I was thinking about the problems very deeply and I, I felt incredibly disconnected from the material. And I realize now, I realize now what I was missing was the application behind the procedure, right? And it wasn't until late high school when I started taking more science classes that I started to really understand why math is so interesting. I started to understand how math can be used in science to solve real world practical problems. So that, that's when I realized I wanted to be a scientist. So so, you know, I, I took some chemistry classes and some physics classes my senior year of high school, and I went to Baylor University in Waco, Texas with plans of becoming a doctor because, you know, that was really my only exposure to what a scientist was at the time, my medical doctor. <laughs> and so I decided to major in chemistry. I took a bunch of science classes my freshman year, biology, organic chemistry, and physics. And, and, and after my first year, I decided I was really interested in the intersections of chemistry and physics. And, and one of those intersections is quantum mechanics. So I decided to dual degree in, in, in physics and chemistry. And over my four years of college, I had the opportunity to, to take several different quantum classes. And I think it was actually, I think, I think it was actually through my quantum classes that I finally fully fell in love with math, right? The math and quantum mechanics, I, I just found it to be very elegant in a way. You know, it, it, don't get me wrong, it was really hard, but I felt it felt familiar enough to where I knew I could learn it, but unfamiliar enough to still be interesting. And that motivated me to learn more about it in my physics classes. And as a chemistry major as well, I took, I took more quantum mechanics classes in the form of physical chemistry and the labs, where I was introduced to kind of the experimental side of quantum. I got to learn a lot about you know, a lot of useful lab techniques like various spectroscopies, which are essentially you know, ways to observe quantum objects with light. I got to I got to take real data and actually see how things worked, how, how, how quantum states of, of molecules as they vibrate or rotate or how, how, how otherwise identical atoms can be distinguished by their quantum spin. And those were really useful experiences. I, I, and I'm really grateful that I got to experience quantum through, through 
two different yet complementary disciplines. Physics kind of gave me the mathematical intuition behind quantum and chemistry kind of gave me sort of the experimental intuition behind quantum mechanics. And, and when I was applying to research groups in grad school, I was definitely looking for opportunities to work in, in quantum research. Next slide, please. So, so, so if I could give any single piece of advice, it would be to work hard, <laughs> you know, the, the good old fashioned work hard. And to quote one of my mentors, number one is work hard. You won't get anywhere in the field without putting in the time. And there's really no substitute for that. And I, for one, actually find that kind of comforting, you know, because it sort of levels the playing field in a lot of ways. You can, you can always make the choice to spend a little more time thinking about a problem set or asking your professor more questions or spending a little more time in lab. It's never too late to choose to work harder. And, and, and I like that because it means that anyone as long as you're curious and you're willing to work hard, regardless of background, you can make that choice. You can be a physicist. Anyone can be a physicist. And so far, I find that I, I'm finding it to be a very fulfilling career, right? But, but, you know, sometimes it's hard, and it's going to be harder for some people than others, right? And, and that's okay. That's really okay. I know several people personally that are able to grasp new concepts and techniques very quickly. And that's not to say that they don't work hard or they don't deserve the positions they're in. But for me, I've always felt like I have to work really hard to succeed in physics. And that's that's even part of what makes it so rewarding for me. But, but you know, sometimes things work out and sometimes they don't. Sometimes I flat out fail, you know, like, like just this last year, actually, I took our physics department's qualifying exams, which are these big annual eight hour tests over two days, solving physics problems for over a bunch of different areas that, that early grad students have to pass in order to move on with their PhD. I spent like a month studying for it. I was feeling good. Even after the test, I was feeling pretty good. And then four days later, I get the results back and it turns out I failed one of the sections. And get this, it was the quantum section, right? And so I felt, I felt especially bad because I thought, oh, well, I've taken all these quantum classes. I'm a quantum physicist. This is my research field and I failed. Therefore, I don't belong here. And that's completely false, right? Later, I talked with one of my mentors about it and I told her what I did and how I prepared and what I studied. And she pointed out, you didn't do enough quantum problems. You didn't practice enough quantum. And I realized she was right. <laughs> I think about quantum all the time. I'm a quantum researcher, I'm a quantum physicist. And so I just assumed that I would do well in the quantum problem section without working at it. <laughs> and this mentor of mine, she made me realize quantum research and quantum problem sets, the two are not the same, right? Doing quantum research or even being an expert in quantum you know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean you can pull any quantum problem out of thin air at any time and solve it. <laughs> now, now it's reasonable to maybe have an intuition or, or process for how to go about solving it, but explicitly knowing how to do the problem from start to finish, even if you've seen it before, it, it, I think is non-trivial because that's, that's just not physics, right? You forget concepts, you misremember formulas, you make math errors, and that's really okay. You just have to go back and review. And if you don't, you reap what you sow, like I did. <laughs> but you know, my mentor and I, we had a good laugh about it. And she was like, it's actually kind of funny that you thought you could get away with this. <laughs> you know what? She was definitely right. I definitely knew better, right? Hard work gets results. And if you choose not to work hard, this is what happens. And when, when, when I looked at it like that, we cracked up about the whole situation. It was funny, right? It's good to have mentors that can give you that sort of perspective. You know, but, but but fortunately for me, as it turns out, I did well enough in the other sections that I passed the overall exam and I could move on with my PhD, but, but I just had to take an extra quantum class to go back and review. And to this day, that class was the best class I'd ever taken in grad school. Because it's not like I was learning it for the first time. It was a class meant to re reinforce a framework that I already had and make it stronger. And people all over the field that I've talked to have very similar stories of this. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, 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 there's, there's the people I work with. <laughs> you know, so physics is hard and sometimes you fail, but it's okay to fail as long as you let failure be your teacher and not your executioner. 
<laughs> right? Don't think less of yourself, just work a little harder at it and you'll be made better for it. And, and I think you'll have a lot more fun in the process. So, so, so to conclude, you know, I'll wrap up with this. Were, were my high school and undergraduate careers perfect for this field? No, I didn't do a program like this, like you guys are doing. And from what I've seen, I think it's a huge benefit for you guys if you choose to take advantage of it. I, I didn't do undergraduate research in quantum. So, so I had this huge learning barrier in my first year of grad school that I had to work hard to overcome. Um, you know, did I always want to be a quantum physicist? Was I always strong in quantum physics? No, <laughs> I definitely considered other things to do, right? Being a doctor, I, I like playing piano, I compose music, I thought about a career in music. And I think this is a good time for you guys to even explore what most interests you. And that if that ends up being quantum, then I think that's really wonderful. This is a good field, right? But but, you know, am I happy with some of the choices I've made and the position I'm now in? The answer is a really emphatic yes. I really enjoy my work. I really enjoy thinking about atoms and light and, and their behaviors. I enjoy the research process. I, I, I get to ask my own questions and think really deeply about a, a research topic that I find interesting. And I, I get to mentor and talk to students like you guys, which I really enjoy. Um, and, and I'm glad to be the one to tell you guys that you are special. Quantum is a field that is open to you if you want it. You have a place here. And, and frankly, we need you. <laughs> the field needs you. And I, I actually look forward to working with some of you guys.